Hey everyone, it's Imran from Options Insight, your macro options spotlight. All right, so uh, equities kind of drifting lower. They did have a bit of a knee jerk lower when Bullard came out yesterday with hawkish comments, talking about terminal rates in the US might be needing to go between five and 7%. So that kind of spooked the market a little bit, front end of the, front, front end of the rates curve, uh, taking terminal rates up by about 10, 10 to 15 basis points. Markets did cover though, uh, later in the day, as um, zero DTE call buying flows came in, which we'll talk a bit more about in a bit. Uh, European stocks outperforming, still given that their, you know, they've got lower relative valuations uh, and underweights for, for, for global investors. Um, so, you know, whilst everyone's been camped out in US markets for a long, long time, there was a, there was a big exit out of European equities when the whole Ukraine-Russia thing kicked off. And slowly, slowly, money's coming back into that as some of the recession fears and certainly in terms of going into winter and the energy crisis abated somewhat. That's getting people um, back into Europe, thinking there might be some relative value there. Um, commodities wise, we also pulled back. So you had gold down, silver down. They didn't really like that uptick in terminal rates uh, expectations. And the oil price action continues to stink. Right. So whilst we're fundamentally bullish in oil, um, you can't deny the price action is looking a bit ropey in oil right now, uh, which is why we're, we're camped out in option strategies anyway, because we have limited loss in, in, our, in our positions like that. Um, China COVID concerns don't seem to be abating right now, um, but it does seem like they're in a bit of a rush to roll out vaccinations, uh, which is why maybe, maybe that, you know, coming towards sort of springtime next year, they'll be in a better spot to really, really go ahead and ease restrictions more. more. Um, European volatilities, looking at the implied vol side of things, still continuing to um, grind higher. Uh, as we'd said, they've reached some pretty smashed levels, uh, pretty cheap levels, so, so they're starting to get bought back. Asian vols were softer, though. Uh, VIX vol got annihilated, uh, down like seven points, down to like 64 now, uh, which looks pretty low to me. Uh, and then commodity vols were mixed, but nat gas vol continues to defy gravity. Um, so that was up another vol point. Whilst it's realizing 67, that implies at 110. So there's a lot of risk premium in the natural gas implied vol levels right now. So clearly they're thinking there's going to be some wild moves in the short term. Right now, the realize doesn't justify that. Right. So um, I, I did bang out some nat gas vol recently. Uh, obviously, you've got to be careful if you sell things like that in terms of your sizing, uh, but but it does look like there's a bit of juice in that to be to be harvested. Um, in terms of skew, it's a mixed bag really on skew, um, but the absolute skews in Nifty, FXI, and uh, FTSE remaining the lowest in absolute terms. Um, put skew in general has been rising across commodities um, as re recession fears for next year are kind of starting to rise. Uh, and obviously, some of the commodity price action has been pulling back a bit more, a bit more steeply. Uh, so, like copper having a pretty bad down day, over two percent yesterday. Okay, uh, if we have a look at FX and and stuff, um, we did see the dollar firm up a bit uh, after the Bullard comments, but it has since retraced after a supply, surprisingly well taken UK budget um, and just general better risk sentiment as markets have traded up. But I do think there's quite a lot of noise around at the moment in asset prices. Um, so I'm not reading too much uh, from, from the price action right now. Uh, bonds have pulled back from recent highs. They were down a percent on TLTs yesterday, but they've got a long way to go um, to get anywhere near those, those recent lows. Uh, in sectors, ARC was down 2% again. Uh, remains heavy, um, as do metals and mining, as, uh, following on from the commodity pullback. FX vols were lower across the board for the majors. Uh, but the but the EMFX like the Czar and the and the Brazilian Real were a bit firmer in terms of vols. Uh, bond vols are continuing to drift slightly, uh, and HYG vol back down to twenty to twelve and a half. Sorry, not twenty. Twelve and a half is starting to look decent value again, and it's carrying at twenty. Uh, gets to that kind of confirms the point that <clears throat> at twelve and a half it doesn't look like a bad thing to maybe start to pick up again. And we are starting to see some option flows in HYG along the lines of buying some volatility. Uh, ARC volatility was up five vols on the week. Uh, wasn't up a lot yesterday, but it has kind of repriced a bit on the week, uh, got a bit oversold, um, and realized remains at 100 there. We're still seeing pretty big swings in that ARC um, ETF. Positive carry showing up in the likes of the EMFXs, but everywhere else is still pretty negative. 
Uh, Sterling Gamma, which was the outperformer, kind of fading a bit as the moves become a bit more orderly. And Dolly Yen, actually the standout performer in terms of um, kind of negative carry here, um, along with Arc, which is also a good Gamma to own for the people who are scalping long Gamma. Um, skew little change across the board uh, in terms of this um, these assets, except really the only notable one was uh, XLV, which is the healthcare ETF. Skew there got hit lower. Um, it does look quite cheap, both versus its own history in the 15th percentile, but also um, versus the other sectors, it looks quite low. And in general, you know, it's not it's not a particularly volatile sector. It's a defensive sector, but you think about it, if markets do start to melt down later in you know next year or whatever. Um, if people are parked out in defensive stocks and defensive sectors, then the stuff they're going to need to sell if they get redemptions and if they just need to liquidate risk is going to be that stuff that they're holding. So you could find that owning skew in those defensive sectors actually pays off quite well in a broad macro sell-off. Okay, what else? Uh, zero DTE. So this is really becoming a force in markets, right? So in the hyper-financialized world where we are, and every economic data point has got the potential to move markets by huge amounts, as evidenced by recent moves we've seen in non-farm payrolls days, CPI prints. Obviously, that was unbelievable, the latest CPI print. Um, but any prints that are away from consensus are having a disproportionate impact on markets, right, in, in this current environment. So the one-day option becomes king, right, because the leverage that it gives you on days like that is unbelievable. Uh, act activity in these options is starting to dwarf all of the other options trading that's going on. So we're talking about 40 to 50% of option flows uh, on the S&P are the same day options, which is getting a bit ridiculous, but that is what it is. So you can see in this chart here, in terms of the color coding, you've got the blue, the red, the blue is the zero DTE volume, the red is the one day to expiry, and the green is everything else. And you've just got, you know, where everywhere you look, the blue is just swamping all the, the other flows are tiny here. And then all the, all the, the majority of the flows are in the, um, the zero DTEs. Uh, and it's having an impact on the market, right? It's really, it's really moving the market intraday. So you saw um, yesterday when the market sold off and, and got after the Bullard comments and got down to 3,900, you started to see the blue line. And this is Spot Gamma's recent tool that they're literally just releasing, which tracks They've got their hero indicator, which tells you what's going on in terms of option flows in general. But they've got they've got a specific screen now for zero DTE options because they know that that has disproportionate impact. So now they're tracking that. So you can see we, we got down to 3,900 kind of levels on the S&P. And we started to see an uptick in the, the, the delta buying in zero DTE. So that's a blue line rising. And then that followed on from making a bottom in the market and the market rallied on from there. And because all those calls have been bought, as we start to rally, the move starts to feed on itself because those gamma hedges then have to cover the delta against the call options that they've sold. And then you see that. And then you see the flow at the end of the day come back down where all those calls that were bought are then are dumped back onto the market, basically. Right? So that, that's what tends to happen. But then if they're, if they're cash settled, they don't need to dump them. But often they'll just liquidate them because you've had a big enough move before the close, so they'll just get out of them. But anyway, the point is there's some serious market impact from these one-day options, and if you're not tracking it as a day trader, then that's a very, very um, that's a very important piece of information that you're missing in terms of figuring out where markets are are likely to go during the day. I'm not personally a day trader, so maybe it's not as important for me to to track it. But for those of you who are day traders. It's becoming one of the most important ingredients right now, certainly in the current market environment. OK, um, what else is going on? Crypto. I had, to, I had to bring up crypto in today's one because obviously after the carnage that we've seen in crypto markets uh, in the last couple of weeks. So clearly the whole industry is in a lot of trouble uh, with, you know, with the fraudulent behavior of, the, of FTX and what they did with client money and stuff and the risk of more failures, um, you know, has put a huge cloud over the space. You've got Genesis. Genesis Trading, a big lender, um, looking for $1 billion emergency funding by next Monday. Good luck with that, Genesis. Um, speculators are now short. So you obviously had CME. This is JP Morgan data saying CME Bitcoin futures contracts. Um, they've got like a positioning proxy here. Uh, and they basically say it's flipped into negative. So very, very bearish sentiment there if you're net short <coughs> Bitcoin futures. Um, and then, you know, these stocks. 
some of these stocks have got direct exposure to FTX, right? So you've got Paradigm looking like they're on the hook for 300 million. You've got Sequoia, Tamasek, Genesis trading in the kind of 150 to 200 million mark. But as you go down, you see Coinbase doesn't have a lot. Okay, so in terms of direct exposure to FTX, Coinbase got next to nothing, right? Whereas if you look at what's happened to the, all the miners and the stocks, Coinbase has got trashed alongside Riot, Mara, which is the Bitcoin miners, Hup Mining. They've all got destroyed and they're all down about 30% on the month, right? So the question for me is, is there some value in Coinbase right now? Because it's, it's, it's getting hit with the whole space, as you would expect. Clearly, the volumes are going to take a hit. Right, because of um, so many people just not wanting to trade crypto anymore. But it's pretty near its all time lows around $40. I mean, it has bounced a little bit in the last couple of days, but you know, down at $40 at the all time lows, probably quite a lot's been priced in there. And if crypto doesn't just end and there still is a crypto market in five years' time, Coinbase is going to do pretty well out of this because it's a US regulated exchange, makes them well positioned to benefit longer term, pick up market share, you know, be the gold standard in the space that people actually trust if they want to, want to do exchange trading. So I, I think dipping my dipping your toes into Coinbase here doesn't seem like the stupidest trade, whether it's a long term trade that you do in Delta one space um, and you hold for a long time. That's probably the clear play if you're a believer in the space. But even on a short term horizon, if you look at what Bitcoin's price action has been, even though the headlines are disgusting in the space, it's kind of hanging in there around 16 and a half K. Um, so I think in the short term, there may well be a bounce coming. And I think playing it via Coinbase, because even if crypto prices go lower, Coinbase is less about the prices and more about the activity, right? And whether these companies are going to be able to generate revenue. And, and there comes a point where they care less about the prices going up and down. The more movement you get in the prices, the more likely there is to be activity from the people who still want to play in crypto, basically, right? So whereas the likes of MSTR, um, you know, which hold a load of Bitcoin on their treasury or, or the Bitcoin miners like Mara and Riot, that their revenues are very much linked to the price of Bitcoin. I think Coinbase becomes starts to become less sensitive to the actual price of the cryptos than some of these other names. So rather than dipping my toes in the other names, I'd be much more comfortable dipping my toes in Coinbase. So then the question is, how do you do it? What trade would you do? That's it for today. Have a great weekend, guys. And um, I'll see you all next week. Thanks a lot.